This is the world's largest map bar built out of 3.5 million blocks. And this is a netherite beacon that goes from build height all the way down to bedrock level. And these are the Minecraft things so large, it's hard to fit it in one video. We tried our best. And hey, according to YouTube, it's impossible to subscribe to the channel using just the palm of your hand. So if you're up to the challenge, high five that red sub button below. It's free and it helps out a ton. What's so special about hanging roots in Minecraft? Well, most of the time, not much. But for a brief period during their development, there was something special about this item that no other item had. And no, it wasn't just the name hanging roots, but rather it was the fact that when the item was rendered on the ground, it would render substantially bigger compared to other items on the floor, which I've got to say, makes it really funny to throw it out of your hand and see it basically grow like it's coming out of a Pokeball. And I've seen resource packs that do this to make treasure items bigger on the floor, but that's all secondhand. The idea of this actually happening in Minecraft for a time, that's pretty funny. And I like to think that Mojang didn't notice this in testing because let's be honest, even they know the hanging roots are kind of a letdown. Minecraft signs, like any kind of social posting, has a character limit, but it doesn't have a limit on which character you're using to hit that. And so if we were to use the infinity sign Unicode symbol and fill up a whole text on top of this sign, then when we close out, we can see that it actually renders so wide that it goes off of the sides of the sign, which I think is pretty funny. And the fact that even 10 years ago, they were looking into ways to use this for decorating their paintings, I think that's pretty sweet. And I mean, come on, what's more fitting than having it be the infinity symbol of all being the biggest one? That's just too perfect. When you look at a block of sand, you're probably not thinking of art. You're probably thinking of a cave-in, but we can actually use the gravity of it falling to our advantage. And that's what this user Kevin JN Guy did here. See, by setting up basically a domino chain of falling blocks on top of a torch like this, we can continue that pattern up and up, so then when we break this bottom torch, it turns the block that it was supporting into an entity, that breaks its torches, so on and so forth, until the end result is that we get the largest falling sand art made in Minecraft. Which would already be cool enough, but the idea of doing this iconic Minecraft wallpaper with it, I think that's really cool too. And if you wanted something else satisfying, you can go in with a water bucket and turn all of those concrete powder blocks into actual concrete. Basically giving you a two for one for something fun to do. I just cannot imagine the stress of accidentally breaking one of these halfway through and watching all of your blocks fall hopelessly to the floor as you know you have to restart. Luckily, those didn't make it into the one minute and 19 clip that showed this off. I think that would have been a lot of pain. And if we're talking about the largest pixel art that can be made, then while you could do this using blocks, the real way to get extremely intricate pixel art in Minecraft is by using map art. Since each one of these maps that you see laid out in a frame is 128 by 128 blocks minimum. So the idea of them making 216 of these maps to create the veil art piece that they have here, I've got to say, that's a bigger number than I can wrap my head around. And if you're wondering why they framed it with so much obsidian, the real answer is that they built this on an anarchy server too. But hey, they often say that good art breaks more than a few rules, so doing it in a place where there's literally no rules on a server seems like a pretty good canvas. Though I'd be worried about someone coming up and blowing me up with an end crystal while I'm trying to build just one of these maps, let alone 216 of them. And when you start to question whether this is actually built in Minecraft or just Photoshop, shopped in, you know that it's something impressive. Illumango is clearly a Minecraft genius. They have their whole channel of videos that can help prove that. But possibly one of my favorite of their inventions has to be this, which is the largest possible cactus farm. And if you're wondering what that means, since it seems like a big claim, we're talking about 10 million blocks worth of cactus farm getting made here. At a certain point, it doesn't even look like a cactus farm. It just looks like a dot matrix. More like you're playing Skygrid than actual Minecraft. But my favorite part of this video showing it off is when Illumango goes into creative mode and stands next to the overflow pipe, and you see that even in creative mode where you're able to clear your inventory at a single press, it still fills up in no time. I don't even think I could type the give command this fast. But hey, if you have too many of them, you could always just throw it into a cactus. Kind of like a snake eating its own tail situation then. And in case you're ever thinking of building this, just know that the amount of items that you need to build this gets really absurd. But hey, if you want to go get nearly 100,000 water buckets and 69,552 blocks of obsidian for all of the nether portals, be my guest. I'm not going to ruin your afternoon or Let's be honest, three years of your afternoons for that. What user timed dilation does here is to build an 11 by 11 fully programmable dance floor. Now I've built one of these just using observers and redstone lamps before. It's not entirely tough, but it can be fun. One of the early redstone projects, let's say. But here it's not only lighting up and cycling through different patterns, but you can also see them programmed in the wool blocks that are going through on the sides. Basically like the dance floor is playing some kind of guitar hero. And then when you zoom out further, you can see all the designs 
once laid out in black and white framing the sides. Which I'll be honest, I would have a hard enough time just building one of those using redstone torches to turn on the right lamps, let alone having it done all automatically for me. And the fact that this was built over 10 years ago and it still remains so impressive, yeah, I've got to say that's really, really cool. And I think this gift that was made by someone in the comments really does the best job of showing it off. Because when you speed it up, it's sort of mesmerizing to watch and a nightmare to think about all the redstone that went into it. For a time, getting a full netherite beacon in Minecraft seemed like something that was completely impossible. I mean, you would need thousands of netherite scrap and ancient debris just to make one of these. And so that's why Wadzi got so many views when they made theirs. But where this got even crazier is in Fizzy Banger's response video to Wadzi. Because let's be honest, even though that's technically all the netherite blocks that you need to make this fully work, you can also add a lot more netherite underneath that beacon. And so if you're willing to get 805,303,260 ancient debris, it's possible to make a netherite beacon that reaches all the way up to the build height. And if that sounds crazy, it is. Or rather, it was. Because with the build height getting a lot taller in recent updates, the Caves and Cliffs update made this a lot tougher to do. And this time, we're talking about 75.5 million for the netherite blocks. Yeah, even with duplicating all of these with shulkers like they mentioned in the methods, that's not a number I can say I'd want to count to anytime soon. Nor do I think I'd be able to count to it anytime soon, so I guess it works out. This gold farm's insane. I doubt I'm gonna get anyone who disagrees with that. And while it's possible to make some pretty impressive gold farms that are up on the nether roof, with this design by Dash Pum 4 does, instead of dropping all the zombified piglins to kill them, instead they go through a series of nether portals until they're released at the top here, and they all die at this killing chamber way up above the farm. Now this is a change compared to the original version of the farm, which was really just Nembon's gold farm, with an added overworld bridge to transport them up to the top of the world. And then with increases added to make it even faster, that got the drops for this farm up to 145,000 per hour. And if you're wondering, that's giving you 1,069 gold blocks every single hour. And in single player too. It's completely friendly for that version. And with the added fact that you have to do basically no spawn proofing to make this work, that's really where it starts to get fun to use. And they offer the world download too, so it's fun for you to just go look at it, even if you're not gonna go build in single player. And with all those gold blocks that you're getting from that farm, you can then go pump all of that newfound gold into user really epic nice's piglin barterer. Now calling this a bartering machine doesn't even seem fair. With 60 piglins employed, it really feels more like a company or a sweatshop more like it. I don't think they're getting breaks, but they're also in the nether, which I doubt the OSHA really applies to. Labor laws aside, with all this bartering that you're doing, we're able to get 200,000 drops per hour. All of that done with 99.997% efficiency. And what's even cooler than bartering all those items is then watching all those items filter around the sorting system multiple times so that they get picked up. And the only times that you don't get all the items from this farm is if they accidentally get discarded because of the sorting system. Look, you're getting so many of them, I think we can expect a little bit of burnage. The fact that it's nearly 100% even then, I doubt you're gonna miss any of the stuff that you're losing out on. I mean, when you're getting enough iron nuggets to literally put to shame some traditional iron farms, I think we can call this efficient. If you were to type in this user's seed and fly out into the outer end islands, granted you're gonna have to travel 28,570,240 blocks to go find it, so uh, hope you got an elytra. Once you do, you'll be greeted with what's possibly the biggest end city that's ever ever been found. At this point, this is starting to look like the moon base that was featured in Mojang's April Fool's snapshot. End City doesn't even feel like the right title for this. End Metropolis? New End City? I have no clue what you would even call this. But as long as it's got all the loot inside for me to get geared up, I'm fine with that. Though I will say, with all of this, to only have one ship off in the distance? Yeah, that's pretty lame. But when you're reaching the point where you're getting exhausted looting an End City that's this big, you know that it's big. Treasure should never be boring. And when you do get bored of the end, you might want to take after what Mog Swamp did here, which has to be the largest end explosion that's ever happened. By turning the end island to a Swiss cheese filled up with TNT, Mog Swamp made this Swiss cheese feel like lactose intolerance as the entire thing blew up. And while it seems dangerous for us if we were to fall down here and not stand on top of one of the obsidian pillars, I think we have to remember just how bad it is for the Enderman. And the fact that there's only a few end stone blocks that are left remaining after this really makes me just impressed at those end stone blocks. They're the resilient ones, and unfortunately they had to get destroyed for the next project project that Mog Swamp built here, but it's kind of like killing 99% of germs with hand sanitizer. You don't necessarily <laughs> want the other 1%, but you can't promise a complete job, even if you go overkill. And while we've seen the largest map pixel art that's ever been built, I think this design by Wanba has to be the largest map room that's ever been built inside of Minecraft. Taking almost 150 hours to produce this video, it gets really surreal to see as they're laying out all of the maps into the frames here. I mean, when they're walking on top of the map, it looks more like Tom Clancy's division than anything you're ever supposed to see in Minecraft. Almost like we're a giant walking on top of the world. But I will say the time lapse of seeing this all get filled in, it's pretty satisfying, almost like scan lines. Now I never think that I would take the 8,000 maps to go make all these, especially with all the traffic
gravel to go fill those out. I don't want to do that much durability damage to my elytra. It really is an impressive way to appreciate Minecraft's world generation. And it's good if you appreciate it because how much this slows down your game, you're really just taking a slide to look at it. When you think of space travel, you're probably picturing something like this. But it turns out a boat can work just as well. Let me explain. See, on Bedrock, if you were to put a boat on top of a pad of slime blocks, bounce on top of it a couple of times, and then get in, then we can ride that sucker sky high. And if you ask me, that's definitely the weirdest and the cheapest way to reach the stratosphere. So if you're tired of building the traditional elevator or ladder, then this will definitely offer some new leverage. Here's how to hold more than 64 items in a stack. Since as Weefy shows off, if you were to shift click a bottle inside of a brewing stand, then it's possible to stack more than one bottle per slot. And then when you go to pick up the stack of bottles from each slot in a row, they'll continue to stack in your hands, giving you a stack that's larger than 64 items in size. And in theory, you could use this to stack up to 2.147 billion items in one hand. So that's the maximum size of the integer value. Then when you go through and make this, don't just place it in your inventory, since all that'll do is just offload one stack of 64. But if instead you go ahead and drop it, then all of those items will exist on the floor and probably be a mess to clean up too. If you drop the warden from build height to bedrock, it would still live. But if you have a 319 block drop into dripstone spikes, then that's enough to kill the warden in a single drop. So clearly the warden is a tough mob to kill, but just how tough is it? Well, looking at a comparison like this, you can clearly see that the warden's health is substantially substantially larger than just about any other mob in the game. It's even more than the Ender Dragon. Though, if the Warden's supposed to be this new unkillable mob, then why does the Wither and Bedrock Edition still have more health? Up to 50 hearts more in hard mode. Brutal. Though, as difficult as that sounds, there is an easy way to kill the Warden without using any armor or enchantments. With just a Strength 2 potion, you can get rid of the Warden before it even finishes its Sonic Boom cycle. Just build up three blocks tall, land some critical hits, and make sure you have enough hunger filled up to regen. Because in just one hit, a warden can deal 45 damage, which to put that into perspective would mean that it wipes out more than double your life bar in a single blow. And to even withstand one hit from this thing, you'd need full protection 2 diamond armor. And even then, that'll still only let you survive on half a heart. But while its melee attack is fierce, its sonic boom attack is severely underpowered. Now, it used to deal 15 hearts of damage, but now it only does 5, which still sounds like a lot until you notice that a witch can survive getting attacked by two wardens without even breaking a sweat. No joke, with how the witch regens with their healing potions, it'll never tie to either of these wardens. Though, there is still one way the sonic boom can deal some serious damage, and we'll see that later in the video. Don't trust this boat, because even though it looks innocent enough, one bump into this thing and yeah, you get the picture. So taken after prank master Grian, the way we pull this off is by having a dispenser place a double chest worth of boats on repeat into the water. And then we break the setup, wait for an unsuspecting passerby to bump or jump in, and our mess gets unloaded. So make sure you're not around when they need help cleaning up. Do not underestimate tipped arrows, because silly as it may seem, we only need to shoot ourselves with one of these to go sky high. As this user shows off, if we were to give ourselves the slow falling potion effect and then use a riptide trident, then we'll be able to keep that same speed going right up in a 45 degree angle. And from there, forget about using rockets for your elytra, we're already well into takeoff. And as pointed out in this comment, the reason that we use arrows in the first place is that the 11 second duration of the effect makes sure that it's only going to be active on the way up, because otherwise we'd just be kind of slow falling through the air with our elytra, which is a little disappointing when you get that much speed on the way up. Now, by all accounts, armor stands seem pretty harmless. After all, they don't have arms, so what's the worst they can do? Well, according to channels like the Horizon, quite a lot actually. Since we can overlap these entities into the same block, we can get a lot of lag in a small footprint. Meaning, after getting enough of these into position, the game's ticks per seconds will slow way down. And then, after dropping these onto a fence with water, the lag gets even worse. And from that point, we continue to drop the TPS and make the server borderline unplayable. Even though my Minecraft's a sandbox game, there are certain rules we're not supposed to break, like placing blocks above a certain height. I mean, why else would it be called the build limit? But that doesn't explain why this site works like so. See, by using a method the community's found for mixing falling sand entities with invisible shulkers, we can essentially make our own builds both above and below the world limit, which can result in some pretty wild sites for sure. So if you're looking for a project in creative, it's a fun tool to use. Never take fall damage again using this one trick, since if we were to follow in the footsteps of this example, you'll notice that if you hit the crouch button right before you hit the ground, then there's a glitch in 1.19.2 that'll negate all fall damage that you would have taken. Now, timing this might be a little difficult, but if you're able to pull it off, it's quite the clutch to have in your arsenal. But one last note from the person who discovered this, you have to be jumping or falling from more than 35 blocks up in the air to get this to work. So don't say I didn't warn you if you fall from 34 and take all the damage. Have you ever wondered how large the Minecraft end is? Because let's be honest, it's not exactly something that you can fit within your render distance. So that's why this post by formerly duck on 
read it, it's particularly interesting to see. And to put this into perspective, all those little black dots that you're seeing right down there, those are the obsidian pillars that tower over us on the end's main island. And if we were to zoom into how small we look over here, well, this gap might seem easy to cross on your screen. I guarantee you it's anything but. And that's why we usually just use the end gateway portals to get from point A to point B. Trying to do this by pillaring over using a fly machine, it's just the worst. If you've ever overpopulated your farm, you're aware that Minecraft has something called the entity cramming limit, which is that if you have more than 24 mobs in a specific space, then if you add one more, the game won't allow it. It'll just apply constant damage until you die, which is great for traps, but not as great for breaking Minecraft. And while you can change this with a game rule, you can also break this limit in survival. All you have to do is just place down a vine, since by just using any climbable ladder in the space of the block, we can get a stupid amount of mobs into this one spot. And if you really wanna give your PC a jump scare, all you have to do after this is break one of the blocks and close in the hole, and then all of those mobs will spill out and prove that maybe it's for the best that this limit's in place. And after we've broken the entity cramming limit, we can use that for some more fun with a couple of skeletons. And if you thought all the entities that were just stuck inside of that one block space was bad enough with the skeletons, then the fact that each of them's created an entity of their own when they shoot off an arrow, it's gonna quickly get noticeable how bad the frames are dropping. And now every time that they're shooting you, they're essentially doubling the amount of entities. So uh, good luck to your computer. Fall damage is something of a great equalizer in the Minecraft world, because no matter the enchantments, the potions, or even the hearts that you got, there's an upper limit for all of that. But have you ever wondered how high that could be? Well, as it turns out, if you were to mix together a full set of Protection 4 and Feather Falling 4 Netherite Armor, a Turtle Master Potion with Resistance 4, an Enchanted Golden Apple, and then laying on a pad of hay bales, that'll let you survive a fall of 4,504 blocks on half a heart. But really, just use a water bucket. Let me know if this has happened to you. You're playing on an S&P with friends, each of you making in progress at the same time until one of you gets a bit too eager and then slays the dragon by themselves. It's a frustrating realization for sure. So to keep that final destination off limits, our solution comes down to dripstone. By dropping a couple of these from a tall height, we guarantee that whoever goes through the portal next is in for a short trip. And folks, this will even work regardless of their armor, making it a perfect addition for your next manhunt trap. Torches are the most obvious way to light up a build. They're cheap, you can craft a bunch of them, and they also happen to work pretty well. So most of us don't tend to look for replacements that often. But if you were to take the time and scan through all of Minecraft's various blocks, there's actually a surprising competitor. For some reason, four sea pickles actually give off more light than a torch in the same block. No joke, these slimy sea things can outperform Minecraft's most iconic light source. So if you're really looking for a reason to build a pickle farm, at least now you got one. Although villagers might not always give you the best deal, it seems like they're always more than willing to give you that deal. Since as it turns out, we can see from this post that villagers have no range for trading. And a good way to test this is by using two different ender pearls while standing up at build height. Throw one to the floor and then one up into the sky. And that way, when you land and start trading with the villager, you'll then be teleported up to the top and you'll see that we didn't even interrupt our trading. And given that other workstation UIs usually have a range to them, like chests or crafting tables. It's weird that this is the case, but it also lets us build this cool design that we have over in the end gateway, so I'm not complaining. Riptide is a fantastic enchantment, and it's definitely a powerful one when mixed with a rainstorm. But even though it's great, it still has a few quirks I can't quite make sense of. For example, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison of using Riptide in a shallow pool versus something with a bit more depth, the difference is night and day, and for some reason, the shallow option will always win out against the competition. And while I can't quite figure out why this could be, it does allow us to get some newfound height and distance with our trident. So next time you're looking for a boost, maybe use your water bucket instead of visiting the ocean. When you're on multiplayer, it's nice to offer some starting gear to the new players, but how do you guarantee that that stuff only goes to those who need it, instead of the rich players who are looking for free handouts? Well, odd as it may seem, this book could do the trick. As Razeworks demonstrates, having a book written like so can overload the data and cause a player with too many items in their inventory to get kicked out when they open up the chest. But if you have nothing, it works as planned. And though I barely understand the science behind it, it is a cool system. Minecraft's FOV can go as low as FOV 30 and as high as Quake Pro. But that's not actually true, since if you were to go into the game's option text file and then tweak these values even more, and the closer that you set these FOV values down to 180 degrees, the weirder your camera gets, until eventually it's unplayable. And speaking as someone who already thought the game was unplayable, 
playable in FOV 30, that's saying something. Here's how to turn your strider into a ride or die. Since back in Snapshot 20W13A, there was a glitch that was added in where if you jumped on a strider and then had a fungus on a stick to guide yourself, then once you angled yourself against these blocks, that would actually allow you to travel 10 times faster than you normally would. Even the strider looks confused, and I can't say I blame it. Luckily, the nether doesn't have any speed limits that I know of, but even if it did, you'd be moving so fast, you'd be able to avoid those laws anyway. In Minecraft, there's knockback, knockback 2, and then the kind of knockback that launches you 1100 blocks away. Thanks to the community's discovery, it turns out that by stunning a Ravager in a build like this, and then sitting in a minecart above, we can get launched hundreds of blocks away from the location. And if you're looking to extend that airtime, maybe bring in Elytra as well for an even greater liftoff. Random tick speed does a lot in Minecraft. If you set the random tick speed to the max of 100 million, then you'll notice that all the mobs around you will freeze in place. Truly, the game just grinds to a halt since it's giving so many blocks in the game a random tick update. And typically these blocks will get a random update on average every 60 8.27 seconds. But with this increased tick speed, it would be every 0.00002 seconds. And at that point, neither the game nor your eyeballs can keep up with that rate. Obsidian takes a long time to mine, but what level of efficiency would you need to instant mine obsidian? Well, under regular conditions, it takes 1.55 seconds to mine obsidian using an efficiency 5 haste 2 netherite pickaxe, which compares to roughly 8 seconds that it would take with a regular netherite pickaxe. And as this user found out, if we go through all the data, we can see that with this give command, we can get ourselves a special level 50 efficiency pickaxe, and that'll let us breeze through obsidian even faster than creative mode. Here's why the hanging sign might be one of the deadliest blocks added to Minecraft. No, I'm being serious. If you boot up Bedrock Edition and place a hanging sign like this, then by throwing a channeling enchanted trident into it in the right angle, you'll see that the trident gets stuck, but it's not deadly. At least, you think it isn't. That is until you have an entity actually walk underneath it. At that point, the trident thinks it's supposed to spawn some lightning, and any mod that comes close enough to it will be struck by lightning many times a second. And then what your friend thought was just a simple store selling tridents quickly turns into a funeral home. There, funeral home. Here we see a comparison between a full row of powered rails compared to what we have on the opposite, which is the most efficient no redstone torture block railway that you can build. And the difference here is that we're only using powered rails and activator rails when we need to, and then spacing them out with 30 regular rails in between, which could help you save on gold if if you don't quite have that piglin farm yet. But I gotta say, even though I know that both of these are equally fast, I'll still never be able to wrap my head around the fact that having entirely powered rails isn't the faster option. But that's probably just for my younger self building a bunch of roller coasters this way. In the past, we've talked about what's the most damage you can do in Minecraft. And as it turns out, it's using a TNT arrow cannon like this one. But the truth is, folks, we lied to you. That's not the deadliest thing you can do in Minecraft. I know, I was shocked too. But the reality is, is that if you set up a command block that's always active, running the command, like you'll see on screen in the description below, this means that whenever you shoot an arrow, it'll become the deadliest version an arrow could possibly be. And at that point, forget about critical hits. You're gonna one-shot everything in the game. Just don't one-shot yourself. Since if you shoot an arrow up and hit yourself, in certain versions of the game, that can cause it to completely crash. After all, Steve only has 10 hearts, and with how much damage this does, it might as well just delete the word heart from the dictionary entirely. It's that bad. Minecraft is famous for its random generation based off a string of integer values. And I think we've all come across these so-called seeds when booting up one that we found online or typing in one of our own. Though on the chances you don't do either, how does the game come up with a seed? Well, the answer is more straightforward than you might think. When left to automatically generate a seed, the game will just use the system's time as that seed. And through this, we're able to access a sliver of the over 18 quintillion possible seeds. And I doubt any of our clocks have enough time to showcase all of those. This goat looks like it's in trouble, but don't worry. Since the truth is, is that goats are fully capable of doing parkour. And all of a sudden this lava pit doesn't feel as inhumane. And the reason for this is because that little bit of hesitation that it does before a jump is actually the goat calculating where it has the best arc to. And you can see all those calculations visualized in this post here. It's pretty cool. Which goes to show that even if you're the best at parkour, you'll never be the goat. Now what you see might look like a lot of beehives, but the truth is, is that it's actually even more bees. Since through the help of commands, we were able to spawn all of these beehives, each of them with three bees inside. And as soon as daytime rolls around, you're gonna see all those bees come out to play. And uh, the results are clear to see. 
mostly because your computer's only gonna render about one frame per second. And honestly, it's hard to say I'm not jealous. Not of the dying computer, but I respect the bees willing to stick that much to their wake up schedule that they'll literally ruin the world. If you're able to fill up a shulker box full to the brim of netherite, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself. And if you're able to fill up a double chest full of shulker boxes just like that, then come on, you're on top of the world. Until, of course, you break that chest and it's over lava. Because at that point, even if our netherite doesn't burn, the shulker boxes sure do. And since each of these double chests is able to hold 93,312 items, that means that with the way that Minecraft creates item entities, that's 1,458 stacks of items that you gotta worry about in your world. Which, I know it's all netherite and that should be a good thing, but when your computer's about to put you back in the stone age, you won't be too thankful for your luck with ancient debris. It's really just gonna be a hot mess. In 1.19, Mojang added in the skulk biome. Don't believe me? Just watch. Now, the skulk block is coded to spread whenever a mob dies nearby, but there's not really a limit to that. Meaning if we summon a bunch of mobs on top of a skulk catalyst and then let the entity cramming take care of them, that'll eventually let the skulk spread into its very own biome, which is equal parts beautiful and concerning. With your riptide trident, we can go up to 200 blocks into the sky. And the way we do this is that if we wait for a rainstorm and then continuously bounce off a slime block bounce pad, each time that we bounce back down, we'll launch higher than the last, which in turn gets us more momentum and we we can continue to do this until we reach so high in the sky that the rain becomes snow, meaning we're so high up in the atmosphere that it starts to get cold up there. And while it's all fun and games, just make sure that you actually land on the slime block when you're ready to come down. We don't need to go from your highest high down to your lowest low. We're gonna use just one ender pearl to get infinite amounts of ender pearls, and then zero amounts of frames. By setting up a repeating command block, we can type in this execute command so that every ender pearl entity that enters the world is therefore summoning other ender pearl entities, which right now doesn't seem that bad, but as soon as you make the decision, or the mistake I should say to throw out an ender pearl, we'll quickly have more than 16 of the things. Then after seeing this, maybe it's for the best that endermen don't always drop ender pearls. Clearly they're a lot more powerful than we ever thought. The Warden's Sonic Boom might not deal a lot of damage to us, but it could be devastating against the Ender Dragon. And as this example shows, with enough of the Wardens in the end, we can effectively blast the dragon off course. I mean, the dragon can't even get back to her perch. It's that bad. Even though you can't see it, I'm wearing a full set of armor right now. And the way that's possible is that we're able to change our attributes through this command. So sure enough, we can give ourselves a full suit of netherite armor that no one's able to see, which would be a fun prank to pull on your friends during a PvP competition. After all, it looks like you should be easy to kill, but the truth is not as simple as that. And that isn't even the only attribute that we can change. We can also make it so that we attack a lot stronger too, letting us get god mode without your friends being none the wiser. Truth be told, villagers do not seem like the smartest mobs. And more often than not, I'm racking my brain trying to figure out their logic. But occasionally, they have their moments. For a case study, take a look at this unemployed villager. Not too impressive, right? But at any workstation within a distance of 32 blocks, and they'll start some serious pathfinding. No joke, these NPCs can even work through mazes to try and find a job, which I'll admit is serious dedication. But why that same villager refuses to restock when the block is right next door, that I'll never understand. Render distance can make a world of difference, and it's one of the more clear benefits to playing Minecraft on a beefy computer. But it turns out on Bedrock that draw distance is even more impressive. See, you might not have noticed, but with the way that the game loads, we're able to stand at the main end island and see the outer islands within view, which I'll admit is a surreal sight. And it's made even more enjoyable by the fact that Bedrock handles render distance loading substantially better than Java. And I imagine this will make pulling off your next flying machine journey a lot easier to do, just as long as you don't fall off. Horses aren't the most ideal form of travel. I mean, you have to spend the time to painstakingly breed for the right stats, only for your special steed to max out at a speed that's slower than the elytra, or it would be unless you're on bedrock. Over here, there's a bug that if you give the parents a potion effect like speed and then breed them together, the offspring will continue to be faster. Do this again for a couple of generations and we can get some supercharged horses, which is definitely a sight to see. And at this point, they're hard to use for a completely different reason. If you go to create a super flat world and instead choose for every block in the world to be made out of enchanting tables, none of them will generate with books, which by itself is already kind of ruining Minecraft, but we can push it so much further. Since if you then use the fill commander world edit to reset those enchanting tables, then they'll have their books back and the result will be a lot more headache inducing. Yeah, each of those books wants to take a peek at you and the result is a lot of lag. Plus it's just creepy too. And while a world made out of enchanting tables is bad enough, one made out of drip leaves gets even crazier. Now, while we could make this only one block thick, the better results that you'll see here are made from thicker and thicker layers of drip leaf. Since as soon as we spawn in and step on our first victim, that block update will cause the drip leaf underneath us to realize that it's not staying on the supporting block. 
And so it pops off as an item. And then this happens again to the next drip leaf, and then again to a few more drip leaf, until eventually we create a ripple of destruction throughout our world. It's like the opposite of watching grass grow in a field of dirt blocks. Instead, you're watching a bunch of drip leaves learn their dirty secret. None of this is real. We live in a simulation. Wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> Now, by themselves, these zombies are much of a pain, but packing a whole bunch of them, we've got something even scarier, lag. And that, folks, is the last thing you want on a server. So to give your friends a tough time, why don't we use an undead union of our own? After grabbing a bunch of zombies, lay down a pile of items, and then wait for them to pick it up. And from there, once their hands are stuffed, those suckers aren't gonna despawn, giving us the mobile lag machine to place right inside your friend's base. In Snapshot 21W08B, you didn't have to use a budding amethyst to get more of this stuff, but instead, by placing a piston facing upwards with a slime block on top, all we had to do was line all faces of that slime block with a corresponding max amethyst chunk, so that when we activated the piston, it would duplicate all of the shards. Which, if you need a lot of tinted glass, could come in handy. But I can't say the same if you need a lot of spy glasses, because those are barely useful when you have one of them, let alone 65. Building vault doors with redstone's nothing new. And while we've definitely seen some really large piston doors, what about a door made out of really large pistons? Made by Crafty Masterman, this here isn't just a big vault, but it's a big vault made out of even bigger large-scale blocks. Blocks. And those large scale blocks are completely functional. Like, no joke, look at the pistons, the repeaters, even the redstone dust and torches. All of them work and all of them are giant. And honestly, when you look small compared to the buttons on the build, you know that you got something serious. But that's not even the largest piston that we're gonna see in the video. Since in this example built by Lord John 25, we get an inside look into how ridiculous it is to build one of these things. Now, obviously, the piston, or sorry, big stin, is itself something impressive to look at. And while it is fully functional, it's only when you fly inside of the machine that you can see how impressive this actually is. I mean, looking at all the redstone inside of this, it looks like you're flying into the matrix. I can't understand this more than ones and zeros. And a lot of the redstone that we're seeing is to bypass the 12 block push limit of the piston, making this truly remarkable to watch, especially when you see it time lapse like this. Here's how to kill the wither in one arrow. You're just gonna need to use a lot of redstone, since what Cubic Meter built here is a machine that's able to use TNT blast to speed up how quickly we shoot an arrow to the point where it's able to do enough enough damage to instantly kill anything. And what I particularly like about this design versus what we've shown off with the rail cannon in the past is that here it uses the explosion from the wither in a blast chamber before deleting it with the rail gun. And honestly, to do all of this for a redstone competition too, that's even more impressive for me. I can't imagine pulling together anything this impressive ever, let alone during the stress of a competition. And that's not the only crazy design from Cubic Meter that we'll see in this video, since what we've got here is not only a way to get us loads of obsidian, but also completely demolish the obsidian and pillars in the end. See, by trapping not just one wither, not two, but 40 withers in the same pillar, we can get ourselves enough obsidian to make a giant overworld gold farm multiple times over per hour. And honestly, with all this obsidian, I'd love to start building with the stuff, but unfortunately, I can't break it quite as fast as a wither. Granted, I can't break any block fast enough to get to 240,000 an hour, so maybe I was gonna lose that one from the start. Using flying machines to dig a perimeter is nothing new, and tiny ones like this tunnel blower have become pretty popular. But what's Sidecraft's built here is something that makes those seem a little small by comparison. And really, to call this quarry giant would be an understatement, since to actually be able to see the whole thing, you need to fly past it in spectator mode. But what this does is exactly what you expect. It'll systematically delete your world line by line. And it doesn't matter if it comes up against water, gravel patches, lava, anything. This monstrosity will take care of them, and then some. So now the only question is, what do you do with this giant hole? This mob farm, conveniently called the End of Light, is one of the fastest mob farms in Minecraft. And what Victor40, VK Tech, and Ima MC have done here is make a farm that's not only completely survival friendly, but one that's also capable of getting us 3.1 million items per hour. Which sounds great, but what items are we getting? Well, really, you have your pick. Since this farm will give you gunpowder, bones, arrows, rotten flesh like a regular mob farm, and then it'll also give you ender pearls, sugar, sticks, glowstone, all the drops that you would get from endermen and witches too. And then with the right kind of portal linking to sync this up, we could also add in other modules for wither skeletons and drowned as well. So uh, you better figure out a good way to store all those items, I guess. Because just this alone, we're filling up almost 900 double chests worth every hour. I don't even know if I could place down 
around 900 double chests in an hour. I guess we got some other prep to do before we build this. Through the use of scaffolding blocks, bamboo can be a pretty helpful thing to have on hand. So if your friend doesn't live next to a jungle and they haven't learned this yet, then how about paying them a little lesson? This is one of the quintessential lose-lose situations. Because on one hand, if they decide to leave it all up, that bamboo is not easy to navigate. But on the flip side, if they decide to take it down with a max efficiency axe, then there's going to be so many items falling from the sky that it might just lag out their entire client. Making both options, in turn, pretty slow to deal with. And with that, folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video. So see if they're right and have a good one. All right.